morning, guys. Could you go ahead and pull up the first slide, please? Yeah, whoever called out. <laughs> Okay, so yesterday we talked about specifically the people group that I was working with while in Spain, and those were the Moroccan Muslims. Now, real quick, is just an overview. First of all, you don't need to be terrified that every Muslim you come in contact with is a terrorist. Second of all, you shouldn't hate them. Third of all, approach and speak to them and love. And third of all, being kind isn't good enough. Their religion is still wrong, and you still need to be on guard when talking with them. You need to be firm in your faith, and you need to know what the other side believes. So today I'm going to be spe speaking to you specifically about what we learned in Madrid and these are the things that we took out onto the streets and these are the things that we learned. Will you kind of go to the next slide please? Okay, mission miss. This is something that we learned before we even took off. We had a two-day training camp that basically was designed to make you be as uncomfortable as possible. We didn't get pillows. Um, we got itchy hospital blankets that were kind of like thin and it was freezing cold. It was like 65 degrees in the room. Um, we had people talking in a foreign language to us all the time and we ate like half cooked rice. Like it was pretty darn awkward, not gonna lie. But the whole point was to teach you to get out of your comfort zone and to embrace another culture as you go on to missions. Now, most of you probably don't say this out loud, but some people kind of think about it in the back of their mind. Missions is not a passport stamp. Guys, I love to travel, I'm all about that, but just don't make that your priority. It's not a souvenir collection. I love goodies, but it's not a souvenir collection. Um, spiritual resume. Going on missions, whether it's here or foreign, it's not going to make you look better in the eyes of God. It's not going to make you look better in the eyes of teachers and peers. It's not somehow to say, hey, look at me. Look, look what like a good Christian I am because I do all these mission trips and I travel and I do all sorts of amazing things. This, that's not what it's about. You know, we don't do works to be saved. We do works because we are saved, because we are called to do them. And it's not a sacrifice. This kind of gets some people. They're like, you know, I worked really hard to get here. I had to give up a lot. And you know what? You're right. It is. I'm so with you. It's a lot of work to raise the money, um, to get your parents on board. It, it is a lot of work, but it's not a sacrifice to do what we were called to do. Can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, dang, that's tiny. So sorry, guys. Okay, so first and foremost, bottom line, this is what missions is. It is to make him famous. And of course, him, God, don't get confused, make him famous. That is the bottom line for any missions in town, whatever, country, wherever you go, that's the bottom line. And often like we like to think of missions as a way to get Jesus points. Um, I think it was Coach Melton and like, Eighth grade, who said this for the first time, she was like, oh, you blah, 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 you got Jesus points. Woo! It's not Jesus points. It doesn't somehow make him love you more. And if you don't go on a mission trip, it doesn't somehow make him love you less. Um, and though we don't say it out loud, we feel as though one good deed will cancel out a bad deed. So a lot of the times in our Christian walk, we think, oh, man, I just, I messed up. I don't know what to do. Oh, but you know what? I'll just be really nice to that person I'm not usually nice to. Or, oh, I'll just go on this cool, huge mission trip, and I'll be good to go. It's not how it works. Go on to the next slide, please. Hey, there we go. Okay, a lot of the times we like to focus on the top line. So here's the bottom line. But we like to focus on the top line, which is God's blessing. Um, we don't participate in missions with the main intention of receiving blessings, blessings but of giving blessings. So in Galatians... If I have it tabbed, here we go. In Galatians 3, 1 through 10, it says this. Please tell me I got it right. Oh, here we go. You foolish Galatians, who has hypnotized you? Before whose eyes Jesus was vividly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? Did you suffer so much for nothing? In fact, it was for nothing. So then does God supply you with the Spirit and work miraculous among, miracles among you by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Jesus, just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness, then understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and took the good news ahead of time to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. So 
the only reason that we are able to have faith as Gentiles was because of the Jews denying Jesus. Therefore, he decided to use them to save us. Now it's our job. Blessings will come through us. And I'm not saying that you don't get blessings in return. It is an amazing thing to be a part of the work that God has called us to. But those blessings, don't go into it thinking, yes, you know, I'm in a really bad place with my relationship with God. So maybe somehow going on this mission trip will just put me where I want to be. That's not how it works. You go in with the idea of making him famous, of blessing people through you. And in return, you will receive blessings from that. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, this is the number one key after you've gotten the bottom line. Hope of the world. And the church is the hope of the world. Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. Please tell me I got that one right too. Here we go. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of the Messiah, and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known to those through the church, to the rulers and authorities in heaven. Um, too many today just decide to deny the importance of the church. I hear a lot of people, and I'm not necessarily like ragging on any one person, but I hear a lot of people say, can you go to the next slide, please? I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You're right, you don't. But here's the thing. God established the church for a reason. The church was his way of making himself known. The church was established for his glory, for his purpose. And it is through the church that we send out people. Sorry. Um, the church is very, very, very important. Um, going to church is an outdated thing. Somehow people think, you know, that was back in the old times. I don't need to go to church anymore. I can stay home and watch something online. Don't lie. You don't do that. Um, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> and church is boring. Um, it's actually not. If you pay attention and if you desire God, if you desire to see God, if you desire to be an ambassador for him, you will get something out of it. And it doesn't matter if it's something you've heard a million times. God's word does not go out and come back empty. God's church is very, very important. He established a church for a reason. We are the body of Christ. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, the church is the bride of Christ. How many people, raise your hand if you've heard of that. Yeah, there we go. Good job. You're learning something. Um, how then can one love Christ but hate his bride? It doesn't work out that way. Have you ever, you know, you don't do this when you walk up to a friend, he's getting married, and you say, hey, buddy, I'm so glad for you, man. I'm just going to support you in your marriage. I'm all for you. FYI, I hate your wife. Like, I wish you all the luck in the world if it wasn't her you married. Like, that doesn't work out, right? So just keep in mind that the church, and it's not just a physical location. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. And you need to hold on to that, and you need to know that that is a rock that God has built his church on. The church is so, so, so important. The perfect God is served by an imperfect people. So let's stop playing the blame game and not going to church because people are hypocrites. Now, I've been in this kind of holier-than-thou position before. It's happened to me before. I'm sure it's happened to a lot of people. But you have to understand that the church is made up of imperfect people. So they're not going to be perfect, and you're not necessarily going to like every person, and sometimes you're going to be like, I don't really want to go to church. You know, that person picked me, or that person's a hypocrite. Guess what? You've been a hypocrite at some point in your life, too. And if you haven't, you're going to be. And if you already have, you're going to be again. That's just the reality of things. But that doesn't mean get down and feel like, well, because I'm a hypocrite, I guess I'm not going to do anything anymore. Like, what? No, get over yourself. This is we are an imperfect people, understand that, so we're not going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean that you need to stop striving, keep striving, understand that you aren't perfect, and that's okay, but continue to reach forward, and understand that as the body of Christ, as a church, we are called to move forward, to be a blessing. Can you go on to the next slide? Awesome. Acts. Sorry, guys, this is hard to see. Acts 2. Now, the second one is ancient work. And, oh, this cracks me up. Oh, gosh, I love this one. Okay, this is a story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Have any, has anybody ever heard of the Ethiopian eunuch story? Anybody? Man, I wish more people would raise their hand. You should so know this story. Okay, um, 826 through 30. I'm just going to go ahead and read this whole thing. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. 
get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to meet it, he heard him reading prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb and silent before his shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch replied to Philip, I ask you, who is this prophet saying this about, himself or another person? So Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning from that scripture. Um, how many of you know where it says he was led like a sheep to the slaughter? Does anybody know where that's found? Where that verse is found? Isaiah, good job. A lot of people, um, if you ask a Muslim where this is found, they'll deny this passage and say, oh, because it's from the New Testament. It can't be true. But guess what? It's found in Isaiah. It's found in the Old Testament. This is proof that, can you go on to the next slide? This is proof that God is doing ancient work, ancient, ancient work, long before our time. And in case you didn't know, God's not American, and we don't take him anywhere. How many, does it bug anybody that whenever you see a portrait of Jesus, he's like so wide it's blinding? Yeah, in case you didn't know, he wasn't born in America. He's not American or anything like that. And we don't take him anywhere. And I'm so guilty of praying this too. God, just be with us as we take you to such so, and such place, or as I take you to this people group. We don't take him anywhere. Okay, he was there from the beginning. God doesn't say, hey, go start a work. He says, hey, come join my work. Come join me where I am calling you to go. Come be a part of what I have called you to be a part of. But you just have to watch. And I put this in, like, huge warning signs. Watch for subtle shifts and, subtle shifts and thought. Um, God doesn't need us. He really, truly doesn't. If he wanted to make himself known, he could have come down, super obvious, big bang, whatever you want to call it. He doesn't need us, but he chooses to invite us to work with him. So just remind yourselves to be very, very humble when you're going about his work. Keep yourself in the right mindset knowing that you're there to make him famous and you're there to be a conduit for blessings. Can you go on to the next slide, please? Awesome. The next one, joy of the sower. I love this one. There are many parts to missions, and not one part is more important than the other. And these are the, um, the four that we went over. Plowing, which is prayer. Sowing, which is contact with the people group. Reaping, which is salvation. And I know it's not a word, but they made it up, and I love it. <gasps> Vintaging, which is discipleship. Can you go on to the next slide? Okay, plowing equals prayer. This is huge. Prayer is not preparing for the work. Prayer is the work. A lot of times, before we go on a mission trip, um, we pray with earnest. We pray, 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 just pray super hard. And then when we get there, our prayers kind of slack up. We're like, thanks, God, for, you know, getting us here. Give us a good day. Amen. And, like, you walk off and go about your day. And so many people see prayer as just that, something you do before the work or somehow a last-ditch effort. God, nothing else is working. Let's pray. That's not how prayer is meant to be seen. Prayer is the work. You do it every single stage. You do it in plowing, reaping, sowing, vintaging. Prayer is huge. Prayer is important. Prayer is how we communicate. Do not fall through the cracks and think that somehow prayer is something that you can only do before the work or that it's somehow only useful before the work begins. Prayer is huge. And I can't tell you how many times we saw that. A really cool story that has to do with prayer. We were walking up and down some of the side streets in this little suburb in Madrid that we were in. And we walked by this building, and it was a tiny little um, Episcopal church. Looked run down, like broken windows. There was no lights on. Paint was falling off. And it just looked abandoned. But we just started praying. We are like, God, we walked by this church for a reason. We saw it. So you have a plan for that church. And we speak blessings over that church. And we just ask that you bring us in contact with people from that church. So we were just walking back down the street. And there's a park in the middle of this little suburb. So we walked, we sat down, we opened up our Bibles, the people that were in my little prayer walking group. 
the second we sat down and opened up our Bibles and started reading, a man and his granddaughter walked by. Oh, gosh, this is amazing. Um, and, of course, this is in Spanish, so it took us a while. <laughs> but he said, oh, are you reading the Bible? And I was like, cool. All of us in our group were blown away. We are like, yes, yes, we're reading the Bible. Do you know what this is? Yes, oh, I, oh, I love the Bible. My granddaughter and I, we love it, we love it. We read it all the time. Yes, and we belong to that tiny church down the street. How crazy is that? Is God not fantastic? I mean, we were so focused. It's not like it was some elaborate 10-minute prayer. We just prayed with a sincere heart. And God just did this. And it's happened a few times. I think we met two or three other little people groups that were from that church. And it was amazing because even though we weren't necessarily able to communicate very well, you could see the joy in their face that someone from America was here praying for their tiny church that was being taken over by a lot of Muslims in the area. They were so thrilled, so happy to see someone praying for their church and someone noticing that they were there. So don't give up on prayer and think that it's not important. Prayer is huge. Pray with a sincere heart and believe beforehand that it's going to be answered. Don't pray in the back of your mind already saying, this isn't going to happen because prayer never is really answered. It's just something we do. It's not just something you do. It's not. Okay? Can you go on to the next one? Prayer on the streets of Madrid. I'm going to do this at the very end, and it kind of makes some people uncomfortable, but I love that. I love making people feel awkward. It's so fun. Okay. Um, eyes open. So <laughs> we messed up on this the first time we were out prayer walking. You know, just out of respect, that's what we do here. We just close our eyes and bow our head. No, X, don't do that when you're prayer walking on the streets. It's not illegal to be a Christian in Spain, but it's illegal to proselytize, meaning it's illegal for us to be on the streets evangelizing. So if we were caught, we could potentially be thrown in jail, which not what I was planning. So keep your eyes open, heads up. And the point is to blend in. You want to use your hands. I'm a huge talker with my hands. I love talking. That's how I get my point across. So the whole point was to make it look like we were having a conversation. So a couple of us would be walking, and we'd just be like this. We'd look at each other, hands open, eyes up. It was just, it was actually a lot of fun. It was kind of awkward at first. And I was like, this is so disrespectful. What am I doing? But then I was thinking, who am I to say that? I mean, we could be caught, and there are other people that could be caught doing this thing. And the whole point is to make it a big show, like Pharisees or something like that. We wanted to make sure that we were useful, and we wanted to make sure that we could get all we could out of this trip. So we followed the rules that the, mu the missionaries had set out for us. Can you go to the next slide, please? Hey, I love this. Okay, use code. And I mean, a lot of you probably have your own thing, code, quote, unquote. I used to say Papa in, like, my journals, and I was like, this is kind of awkward. I don't know if that's, like, respectful or whatnot. I don't know. And so when we got there and they said, you know, you can't say God on the streets. And so we're like, okay, what do we say? And they're like, Papa. And I was like, yes. Okay. So Papa is God. PR is prayer. So we'd say, um, Papa, be with us as we are PR walking, okay? Um, the club, you can come up with anything else. I know it kind of sounds like a ghetto, but club is church, <laughs> helper, Holy Spirit, friends, or Christians, and M's are missionaries. And this is a huge thing. Um, whenever you're going to, um, even for, especially foreign missions, don't go thinking that you know everything and, oh, you're the big Christian on campus and you're here to, you know, just run through all these stop signs. The missionaries have been there and are established for a reason, and they have rules and guidelines for a reason, so follow them. Can you go to the next one, please? Hey, sewing, making them known. This is a part where we do physical contact, and I so encourage you when you're doing missions, go about as a local. We walked about a minimum of 10 miles a day, so I, by the time we were done, I walked about 100 miles. Ugh, killer. I don't even run a block. It was rough. Okay, um, go to local restaurants, not American ones. I can't tell you, we had falafels for lunch and sometimes dinner. I got so sick of falafels, but hey, it was a way to get to know a Pakistan man that was there. So get involved. Go on to the next one. Okay, go up to outside markets. This is huge. This is where you can get a feel of the lives of the people groups you're trying to reach. When we would go to markets, there were Muslims everywhere, massive. I don't think you saw anybody that wasn't a Muslim. And so it was huge that we got to interact with this people group that we were trying so hard to reach. 
Um, participate in local activities. Spain has a nap time, straight up, whole city shuts down. The best thing for me, because if you know me, I love to sleep more than anything in the world. And we participated in that. We didn't necessarily get, like, they sleep for like three hours. I think we slept for like one. But anyways, just be a part, because it'd be really awkward if you decided to ignore the whole nap time and you go outside to minister on the streets and no one's there. You know, get a feel for the culture. Know what's happening. Can you go on to the next one? Reaping. Christ is the only one who can reap. And before I was always thinking, well, you know, I'm here. Shouldn't I get to see the work? It's not fair that I plant and I don't ever get to see the work. And what do you mean I don't reap? What do you mean I don't get benefit out of this? And, oh, gosh, I love this. Okay, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now the one planting and the one watering are one in purpose, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Guys, we are the ambassadors for Christ. We don't save anything. We don't start anything. We don't end anything. We're going in. We are the word coming out. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are speaking his love, speaking everything about him. We are being honest ambassadors for him. And that's kind of rough for some people because they're like, I put all of this work. What do you mean I don't? reap that's not fair like you know what this is a blessing in and of itself to know that we are invited to do something so fantastic so big as making God known and so just understand and humble yourselves and that should actually take off some of the pressure knowing that you're not the one who saves anybody and that's okay because that's not our position as the creation to save that is the creator who saves that is what he does he goes in he transforms lives and we can be the ambassadors. We can be the conduit through which he makes everything happen. So understand and humble yourselves before you go into any missions that you don't have to keep a tally in the back of your head saying, oh, I told this many people about Jesus, and I think this many people got saved, and oh, man, I have all these cool stories, and be like, I saved this person. How crazy is that? Well, yeah, it's crazy because you're crazy because you didn't do it. Um, can you go on to the next one, if there is one? Awesome. Vintaging. Okay, this is fun, made-up word that I absolutely love. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We weren't called to just share the word of God with someone, and then walk off. That's not how that works. You don't just, we need to make mature disciples. They, God would, I'm sure, much rather have one devoted, absolutely till death follower than a hundred mediocre, lukewarm Christianity didn't save my life. Okay, so don't just think, I know that missions is kind of a limited thing. You only have so many days to do it. But be intentional about what you do. Make sure that you are discipling people. Make sure that you don't just say, hey, here's God, and then let them make some rash decision right then and there. Let them know that it does cost something to follow Christ. But you know what? That cost is worth it. It's very, very, very worth it. So make disciples. Don't just invite lukewarm people to join a faith that they're not going to let change their lives. Okay? That's not the point. We want to go in. And we want to be ambassadors for Christ. We want to be firm in our faith. We want to let people know that this is important. Disciple them. And then Luke, ah, that one's good. Is there any more? Okay, awesome. So this is just, over the past few days, this has just kind of been a bit about what we did in Spain and what we learned. And I can't tell you how many times we saw God move. Not because we were trying to be this big Christian American group that went in and said, I'm going to save everybody. It's because we were faithful. We were consistent. We prayed. We did the little things. We followed what the missionaries had given us. We worked hard to humble ourselves. That's a very huge thing is to humble yourselves. So just keep these things in mind before you're doing any kind of missions, whether it's here in Lubbock, whether it's helping the food bank, whether it's going over. It doesn't matter where you are because God is already there. We are following after God. We're not going before him. We're following after them, after him. And that is huge. You should feel very protected in that, knowing that 
he has prepared the way, he has done the work. So just keep these things in mind next time you're on a mission trip or anywhere you go. So I'm going to pray for you the way that we prayed in Madrid, and I want you guys to keep your eyes open and heads up too. Don't feel awkward. If you don't want to look anywhere, don't look anywhere. That's okay. (laughs) Papa, I thank you so much for who you are and for the work that you are doing. You are amazing. My mind is blown away sometimes at the things that you can do. And I just pray for the ends that we work for, especially during Missions Week. I just ask that you be with them and guide them and help them to make decisions before we come over. I just ask for your friends, our friends, for your helper to guide us in the things that we need to do. I ask that you help us to humble ourselves, knowing that it is not us who starts or finishes anything, but that we are your ambassadors. I just PR that you give us a fantastic day and that you give us joy as we go through our day. Amen.